today with Heather Ritchell from Ritchell Logic. Heather, thanks so much for joining me. So happy to be here, Flo. Thanks for inviting me. My pleasure. My pleasure. Heather, you know, in the industry as someone who knows about revenue management, but before we get into that, I wanted to share with you that I very, very much remember our first conversation because it marked a point in my career. You were the very first call I had to do when I started with AirDNA back with their data partnerships program. And I remember that Scott Chatford, the CEO back then, he told me, you have to talk to Heather. She comes from the hotel industry. She knows this stuff. She knows the importance of data. Like she will recognize like what we can do. You were with Red Awning back then. That's and right. yeah. since I had just joined, I think it was really my second day. I had no idea really what AirDNA did on a deeper basis. I didn't have a pitch prepared. And I just remember this awfully awkward sensation when you talk to someone and you were painted like this like <laughs> person who were like really the the we were all learning yeah and but anyway that's my story how i got to know you and then obviously we bumped into each other several times in the trade shows and i remember that call being just fine <sighs> you know didn't notice anything odd about it so that's that's how time washes yeah. over things it Anyway, as it's custom in this interview series, we always start dialing back to early days because we want to tell your journey. We want to tell how you got to where you are today. And so the very first question is always, what did you want to be when you were a kid or when you were a young person in the States? Oh, yeah, this question. So this goes back to like your aspirational dream well i was always fascinated with like just having more international experience and wanting to travel and i had this idea that like being in some kind of negotiating political or law type roles so equated to this like international negotiator you know what is that job that'd be such a cool job and from there well that was kind of the odd vision when i was really young did you, did you look into that at all, what it would take to study or what would be a good career path? Or was that just your first, that sounds cool, and then never never materialized? Yeah, then, then really I thought like, well, really what I should do is help people. I should find a job where I'm helping people, right? Yeah. So that led me to nursing and social work. And so that was my initial career discoveries, like dabbling and working in different medical jobs or social work jobs and then i was like this is not for me that's a tough, <laughs> like a, that's a tough gig yeah <laughs> and people in those roles are special and that you have to separate you can't take all that stress home with you right and you're literally saving lives right and like medical professions yeah. but it kind of led me to my first hotel job because i was like just like you know what what's next because this isn't it and that's when I found a job at Swiss Hotel. So that was a very international company at the time, downtown Chicago. And then I was like, oh, now this is fun. Like, this is fun work. Now I'm exposed again to like travel, thinking more globally. And um, it was just work that was less stressful and more fun. So, so. What, ex what exactly was that, that first job at the, at the hotel? I was a sales assistant. Yeah, so working on like contracts and both for like individual contracts with like IBM and, you know, Google, and then also doing things like group business, you know, meetings and events. So it was kind of both sides, but yeah. So that got me exposed to, and actually I only did that job for like a year and then I moved into revenue management. So I've really been at revenue management. Yeah. Yeah. So what was, what triggered the move to, to revenue management? Because working in sales, like, either it's like completely not your thing or you, you make good money and you realize like, hey, sales can be fun. Was that a vision in sales where you said, it's a bit repetitive, I want to do something more, more on the analytical side or what triggered that move? Yeah, I was really just drawn to the work of what revenue management was. And there was like new technology at the time. So they, you know, that job became available as like a revenue analyst. 
And to me, that was just more interesting to be like looking at the data, thinking about how you're selling on channels, because that was also like really rapidly growing. Yeah. Like, you know, that was like ExpediaHotels.com acquisition time and things like that, where just the world of distribution was also kind of exploding. Yeah. What, what year are we talking about now? It's probably 2000. Okay. Yeah. Because I mean, as we all do, at least in the U.S., you remember where you were on 9-11. So I was, okay. that was, I was there at that job actually when that happened. Yeah. Yeah. Also interesting times for revenue managers. And yes. Um, for sure. And you, you mentioned that you were using technology, revenue management technology back there. And I imagine revenue management technology back then and today must have been quite different. Yeah, and I think, you know, we've seen for the hotels at the time, it was really, the, oh, we should do what the airlines have done, you know, and here the hotels are five to 10 years later, building technology for hotels. And so I was really fortunate in that the company I work for was now installing this technology and putting it to use. And, you know, that was, it was new because it wasn't, you couldn't treat a hotel exactly like an airline or, you know, seats on a plane, hotel rooms, that was a lot of what the conversation was about, right? Was this instant booking, digital environment, distributing across all these audiences, and then how the technology needed to enable, you know, real-time price changes on a regular basis. But just, I mean, sidebar, kind of interesting today, like short-term rental, you know, we still don't have technology that updates rates more than once on the overnight. No. Whereas at that time, hotels were like, you know, quickly soon after that doing like three times a day where you could check your, you know, a customer might check a rate and come back four hours later and maybe the rate would change. Right. So that level of sophistication was already just kind of behind airlines, you know. Yeah. So on that, as a, as a quick side note, because obviously that's something that interests me personally quite a bit with my current role. Do you think we might see property managers or systems and vacation rentals that change rates two, three times a day? I don't see why not. I mean, ultimately it's, you know, the, our industry is a instant book lodging industry for the most part. I mean, there are exceptions where, you know, certain types of accommodations don't allow instant book, but customers want that at their fingertips and there's opportunity if, you know, there's spikes in demand yeah. There's truly an opportunity to raise rates, you know, once like an event is announced, right? Like things move so fast. So if systems actually, now that might be more major markets, I was, you know, more heavily convention event markets, but that's how fast things move, right? Yeah. I was, just, I was also just thinking, it's also one of my favorite themes, how different our industry is in regards to the supply and that we sometimes struggle naming it. Some people refer to it as vacation rental, short-term rental, whereas if I rent an apartment in an urban environment, I don't really see it as a vacation rental. It's much more competing with the city hotels. And like you said, then the environment is very different than if it's a very traditional vacation destination with pretty marked seasonal changes. Whereas possibly in that environment, if it's very much vacation rental, seasonal, not entirely sure if consumers would appreciate daily like changes rates changing three times a day where it's like hey honey i saw this amazing house we should go to in summer just to rate is different and now it's again different where it might trigger insecurity whereas yeah in urban markets you might expect that even more but we are going slightly off topic but yeah revenue management is the, is part of the the conversation today obviously so you dove into revenue management and then how long did you stick with that role? So just a few years and then I took an opportunity to take kind of a larger director level role at Kempton Hotels. And then I spent the next almost 15 years with that company because I, I jumped over at the time when they were experiencing rapid growth. And then the last like three years I was there, IHG acquired Kimpton. So then there was even a, you know, larger kind of ecosystem and change that we went through. So it was a really, I mean, I really grew up and spent a lot of time at Kimpton. It was, it was an awesome company to work for. So. 
And like in, the, in those 15 years, I've, n I've never spent 15 years anywhere. Eight? I can't share that experience. Uh, <laughs> I'm too antsy, if that's a word. What was the evolution that you saw for yourself in these 15 years? And what was the evolution in the company that you saw? Yeah, I mean, we more than doubled in size. And I moved from Chicago to Washington, D.C. to San Francisco. And, you know, when I left, I was vice president of revenue and distribution. So had, you know, really been able to grow my career as the company grew. And then also seeing the transition of being privately owned to being pub part of a publicly traded company was also just a great experience and going through that. I agree with you. I don't think I would have stayed, but because of how much change there was, it was, there was never a dull moment. You know, so I didn't get bored, right? And there's this opportunity to like keep going and learning. Yeah. But then you did leave. I did. And that that was your yeah. jump into short-term rentals slash vacation That's right. rentals. Yeah, yeah, and technology. More on the technology side too. How, how did you get together with the Red Awning? How did that? Happen? Um, they found me okay. because they were looking for someone based in the San Francisco area, and. It was interesting timing because hotels, all the like major hotel brands, like when you looked at the quarterly earnings calls with all these like big hotel brands, when asked that question, like, you know, do you feel threatened by this, you know, these homes for rent and at the time, like alternative accommodations. Mm. Um, and it, the answer was like, no, you know, different business, not a threat. As it was a threat. And in markets, when the supply was growing like crazy, it was a disruptor and people were choosing that type of a combination over hotels. Hotels are kind of maybe having to pay attention to price points of that. And Expedia was displaying them like one on top of the other. You know, the channels were also experimenting with how to serve this up to guests. And here we are today, right? There's Marriott Hotel, Hotel or Marriott Homes and Villas, right? So like... Every choice had choice vacation rentals. Like the brands have now worked to figure out one fine stay, right? A core, what is their flavor of how they, you know, enhance their accommodations brand to include this type of inventory. So we've come a long way. <laughs> that, that reminds me of my second or maybe third call where I was just listening in with one of the sales guy back at AirDNA. So this could have been, Honestly, five minutes after our conversation ended, where I listened into a training call, and I remember it was a, an American hotel chain who said, we host, like, close to our one of our locations, there's a PGA golf tournament every year. And compared to last year, we dropped in, I must have been something around 40% in sales compared to last year. And they said, we, like, we've got hotel data, we know it's not the competition. And we know what is supposed to happen, but we're flying blind. So we're assuming people are going to, uh, yeah, the alternative mm -hmm. accommodations. And we need data to understand what's going on. And for me, it was like, oh, listen, see, hotels are widening yeah. their horizon and starting to understand where it's now. And that is also pre-pandemic, where still many hotels, short-term rentals, vacation rentals, I don't care. And then as soon as the pandemic hit, people, they're going to the apartments. They're not going to my hotel. They don't want to stand next to someone at the buffet. I need to understand this business much, much better. And I agree. Now we're very much interlinked. And the, cons the expectation, right, of guests in that, why can't I expect a hotel experience at an apartment or a home? You know, what does that mean? What is that journey of like the guests, right? And their stay. And can I expect a, a branded experience and consistency? I think we're, we're only going to see more and more of that. But, you know, and there's still, I think, the demand for the quirky yurt or odd, you know, car accommodation or something kind of fun and wild that people look for. On the flip side, there is this expectation of professionalism and hospitality and, you know, that type of lodging experience. Then Red Awning had a situation, commission-based model on the right track in theory. And then as many other companies, COVID hit. 
and it started to become a not ideal business model. I remember I worked with you on some projects and Tim back then had to look at his numbers and realize that it can't continue the way it did. Uh, how was that experience for you from hearing that COVID is a thing to uh, your potential end at Red Awning? I mean, it was with any early stage company where, you know, if you're not profitable and burning or you need to raise again, and then the timing of that versus a global pandemic, you know, how fast do you try to stop the bleeding, right? Because if business just stops overnight, you have no reserves, you're in big trouble, right? And the cycle, anyone can look at the cycle of like when they raise versus how many years later this was that the pandemic hit and it's just the timing was really bad, you know, from that point too. And you think about how are you going to evolve the business pivot to get through something like that. And we saw, right, other companies kind of ended up shutting their doors. So um, sure. for Alfred. me, it was clear it was time to go. <laughs> Stay, Stay Alfred was a, a uh -huh. project that's uh, with Jordan, super smart CEO. And he's got another project now. It looked like one of the winners, growing, 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 and then fairly quickly disappearing from yeah. the scene. Then after you left Red Awning, there must have been Heather sitting at some point at home meditating on life and the opportunities that this change might give you and that was that marked like a big change in your career because you made yourself self-employed at that point yeah i never thought i'd have my own company before that you know i grew up working for just like big brands and then the you know kind of this early stage tech company opened my mind to like some other interesting you know ways of thinking about how you want to take your career right and the the timing was interesting in that the all that hotel knowledge i had was like desperately needed really in short-term rental and i was still learning too and we all still are kind of developing like what is what does revenue management look like in this industry meant much is the same but much is very different and that timing was just really good and that people wanted they figured out it was a really important thing to know and to have in your business, right? Like channels were new in this industry at the time, 15, 20 years behind hotels, but people trying to figure out like, I can have the right price, but if I'm not listed well correctly on Airbnb or Verbo, I still may not sell my the night, right? So how do you bring it all together, right? And so that revenue management distribution best practices, I think has come a long way in the last three to five years for our industry. I mean, in that sense, COVID really poured gasoline on the situation. It accelerated the process. And I, again, I remember this vividly with, like when we went to trade fairs and people were like, ah, you know, I've been in the industry for 30 years. I know my market inside out. I don't need this data stuff. Um, and then COVID hit and people were like, oh, I understand what's going on. My experience just went out of the window because I have no yeah. idea. Seasons are, are not seasons anymore. Now you can travel, tomorrow you can't. How am I supposed to price my properties? I remember a conversation with a gentleman that's like, I just doubled my rates because people could travel and people were booking and then I doubled them again and people were still booking. It's like, I, where does this end? I have no idea. I think, yes, in that sense, it was uh, interesting and positive for the industry with all the negative stuff that happened just for everything data driven in the sense of revenue management to catch up with the hotel industry i think you're right yeah and i think i always have this theory airline hotels resorts casinos restaurant revenue management and my partner and i have done revenue management across all of lodging and at Cornell University, they teach these courses. They do not teach short-term rental or short-stay revenue management yet, right? But I think that's where we're headed, right? It's a discipline of itself, just like restaurants, casinos, hotels. And we're in this cool place of establishing, like, what are all the best practices? What is the definition of the discipline and what it looks like? Which would then also mean the end of my journey's interview series, because from the hotel industry it's i went to hotel management school graduated went to work for a hotel and here i am we're in short-term rentals and this is why this interview series started 
it's a million stories with a million backgrounds. We're, we're growing up with our adolescence of the short-term rental industry's journey. Mm -hmm. That's what fascinated me so much. It's a big step to set up your own shop. Did you feel it was out of necessity, not entirely sure what to do? Or did you realize, hey, there is a clear opportunity for my skill set? So I think now it's the time to benefit uh, from my experience, as you mentioned, and, and just do my own thing. And how scared were you, were you when you did this? It just was like everything kind of kept moving forward. There was just like this momentum. And what's interesting about starting a company at that time was there were like people that were more available. So I reconnected. My partner, my business partner today was also in a place where he had um, changed his career and he was like, we started talking and truthfully, the business has been built because we came together too. Like we have two very different skill sets. So just the alignment of there was a need, you know, in the industry, on the flip side, there were people available like to bring together to like empower what it should look like. That was the other reason that just kept going. I mean, when you're, you're building something and you're figuring out there's no roadmap. Right. They say, right, it's lonely at the top. You have to kind of like find outside resources to inspire you and give you ideas about what you want to do next. And it's it's been a wild ride to a little over two years now. The business just there's you know, it's unlimited opportunity, really. That's exciting. Now that you've set up your your own project and you're enjoying your own success, could you ever envision going back to a corporate environment? Um, at this point, I would say, I think it would have to be something larger than that, right? Like some type of integration of what I'm doing today, you know, and feeling like if I were to sell our, my business, you know, and partner to make it bigger and move forward, that would be a cool opportunity, but to just kind of leave and go back to a role it isn't, doesn't really sound that exciting or interesting anymore. Yeah. Every other <laughs> answer would have really surprised me. Uh, let's talk a little bit about that because we're also coming slowly towards the end of our conversation. How do you see yourself today? And where do you see Ritual Logic Project moving in the next couple of years? I think I have this interesting vantage point of from the moment I moved into this industry, I kind of said like, okay, it's not hotels, it's different. But I have to tell you, everything is really similar. It's got a different flavor to it. But I do think because I experienced this hotel journey evolution, it's really all the same shit. Sorry, <laughs> but it's just like, it. it really is. And so you have some foresight to figure out where the white space is you can start to see the lanes mm. and yeah, it's like a little different, but ultimately the whole industry has got to keep going in this direction. We're working on projects and different things related to revenue management, analytics, you know, business intelligence, where we see there's a need that's only going to get bigger. That's kind of where our head is at with Richard logic and where we can take the business and really has been using our past experience to inform where we know this industry does need to go and is headed. This is also what's going to separate the pros from the part-timers more and more? Definitely. I think the hotel space is very fragmented too, right? You still have independents and big brands and they do survive. There has been more consolidation, you know, even in that space. I think that will continue here. And guest demands, guest expectations will continue to evolve. The professionalism will continue, but maybe the small guys will still have a place. Now, fast forward, Richard Logic is being acquired by one of the big guys who says like, hey, we want to do a consulting business. We like what Heather built there. Uh, you get a golden parach parachute. What would be a cool project at some point? You can create whatever you want to do. You know, I'd like to teach, I think, like in this like long-term vision of like, you know, after that and yeah, be able to, I don't know what that looks like, right? But some type of education role 
has always been really interesting to me. It's really funny you say that because I haven't done that many of these interviews just yet, but with other conversations, that seems to be a theme where as soon as money is not motivation anymore, as soon as money is, I can pay my bills, I can live a good life, we as humans seem to always strive for purpose. And then at some point it's about giving back. We want to educate, we want to share, we want to help other people be successful because our own success has manifested itself. And now it's, hey, what can I do for others? Which is something I'd, I really started to enjoy that that seems to be the end note of the conversation. Personal success, bring that with the next generation, so to say. Heather, thank you so much for your time. I really like your story. I really think you're a pioneer in revenue management and helping this industry in this journey. And thanks for sharing your journey. Thanks for having me, Flo. Yeah, I always enjoy talking with you and really think it's great that you've launched this and what you're doing is bring these stories to life. So appreciate being a part of it.